space. Um, before I begin my presentation, I just wanted to first acknowledge that each and every one of us may be have varying familiarity with the history of race and racism in science and medicine. Um, and I want to honor these varying degrees of familiarity and invite you to remain curious and feel empowered to ask questions and initiate open discussion at the end of the presentation. Um, but with that said, I am excited to share my talk titled Racism and Medicine, Reconciling the Past and Present. It's not uncommon to hear 2020 be described as the year of America's racial reckoning. The high profile killings of Black Americans, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and Ahmed Arbery called attention to not only police brutality and racially motivated violence against Black and Brown communities, but also to systems, institutions and behaviors that uphold white supremacy and inequality in our nation. At the same time, the COVID-19 pandemic has and continues to disproportionately impact underrepresented racial groups, specifically Black, Indigenous, and Hispanic communities, as a consequence of longstanding failures in healthcare and public health that have increased their risk for infection, severe illness, and death. Finally, Increased attention has been placed on the human rights and health violations committed by the US in for immigration and customs enforcement against migrants from non-consensual gynecological procedures imposed upon individuals, unmanaged COVID-19 outbreaks and poor sanitation and nutrition, ISIS failed to ensure this population's physical and emotional safety. Indeed, the last year brought America's historical failure to confront structural, institutional, and interpersonal racism to the forefront. However, recognizing racial injustice is not the same as rec reckoning with it. This sentiment is aptly described by Washington Post columnist and former co-host of NPR's All Things Considered, Michelle or L. Norris, in her December 18, 2020 article titled, don't call it a racial reckoning. The race toward racial equality has barely begun. She writes, a reckoning is not an action item on a wish list. It is a thing, an accomplishment, a checked box. A reckoning by definition refers to the moment when we finally deal with an ugly situation. It is more than just admitting there's a problem. We can't increase racial equity without eradicating white supremacy. The enhanced value placed on white life is the United States default setting and has been since the formation of this country. Unspooling that will require much more than a year of so-called reckoning. It requires a full reboot and a commitment to let go of the things to which people cling consciously or subconsciously. The race toward equality isn't over. It has barely begun. The call to address racism in the United States must be heeded in all elements of our society, including scientific and medical disciplines that have historically been and continue to be conceptualized as neutral, objective, and apolitical. For far too long, the fusion of race, medicine, and science has been assumed to be for the best of intentions. And while there has been an increased attention to racial disparities in medicine and public health over several decade, decades, it is critical still to situate these trends historically. Doing so reveals how race-based scientific and medical practices have and continue to perpetuate discriminatory ideologies, practices, and behaviors. Scientific racism describes how the authority of science can be used both consciously and subconsciously to justify inequalities between natural groups of people and notions of racial superiority or inferiority. Medical racism, which can be viewed as a consequence of scientific racism, refers to prejudice and discrimination in medicine and the healthcare system based upon individuals' race. Central to both scientific and medical racism is the use of race as a legitimate analytical category. Conventionally, a race is understood as individuals who have common origins that result in biologically transmitted physical, mental, and cultural traits. The problem with this formulation, however, is that it assumes that racial categorizations are universal, natural, and temporally stable. The reality is that we 
when we identify and label people as a particular race, we are referring to groups of humans separated by artificial boundaries that change depending on time, geographies, and socio-political context. As such, I find it much more useful to view race as an ideology that reflects the narratives that individuals construct to understand their social reality. It also signifies and symbolizes social conflicts and interests by referring to different types of human bodies. This makes race an unstable category and helps explain how the construction of racial identities have been imposed to maintain unequal power dynamics and reinforce the oppression of the historically dominated. Consequently, this requires us to understand race historically and how it has been understood, used, and abused in a variety of sociopolitical and cultural contexts. There's three key reasons why I believe health practitioners should examine the history of scientific and medical racism. First is knowledge production. Examining this history can help scientific and medical practitioners recognize that much of modern Western scientific and medical knowledge cannot be divorced from the historical context of slavery, colonialism, and global imperialism under which it was produced, a context that ultimately shapes racism and discrimination that we see in our society today. Secondly, context. Contemporary racial health disparities and inequalities cannot be divorced from a larger historical context and trajectory. Decisions made on global, federal, state, local, and individual levels throughout history have enabled racist cultures and policies that disproportionately compromise the health of black, brown, and indigenous communities today. And finally, bias. While science and medicine are conventionally understood to be objective and neutral, it is critical to keep in mind that they are carried out by real people who operate in the social world. As a result, the types of questions that are or are not asked, the way that data is or is not analyzed, and how we choose to or not to apply scientific and medical knowledge is ultimately a reflection of sociopolitical, economic, cultural, and moral considerations. In other words, science and medicine have affected the production of race, and race has affected the production of science and medicine. Of course, that is not to say that medicine and science are inherently bad or untrue. The many societal advances that have come from the medical and scientific enterprise are indisputable. However, just because science and medicine work, that does not mean that we should not interrogate and challenge the authority granted to it to understand and shape our social world. As health practitioners, you are all uniquely positioned to challenge racism and inequality in medicine and science, from institutional practices and medical education to interactions with individual patients. In today's presentation, I will begin by providing a broad history of the construction of race in medicine and science. This will be followed by a handful of case studies that demonstrate how the construct of race has been deployed in a variety of medical and scientific settings. And I'll then conclude by examining how both of these histories influence contemporary racial health disparities and steps medical and scientific practitioners can take to promote anti-racist health institutions and practices. Today, if you were to ask a medical practitioner or a scientist if there are biologically distinct races, the chances are is that they would say no. This is because in biology, races are often described as a population of species that have had little or no genetic exchange over a long period of time. In humans, genetic data shows that there is no evidence of fixed long-term isolation between populations, and as such, there are no biologically distinct races. Despite these findings, however, the concept of race continues to hold a firm place in the biological sciences and consequently medical practice. Scientists have struggled with and debated the concept of race for centuries, often proposing misleading explanations for racial differences. Beginning in the 18th century, physicians and scientists in Europe and the United States discussed and attempted to define racial difference, largely in an attempt to justify the existence of slavery in the Americas, the colonial system, and global imperialism. <clears throat> 
During this period, scientists struggled to reconcile Christian theology, which asserted that all humans were descended from Adam and Eve, and scientific knowledge when it came to the question of the origins of man. From this question stem two dominant schools of thought, monogenesis and polygenesis, both of which reinforce the idea that non-white subjects, particularly black and brown communities, were savages and racially, intellectually, and physically inferior. Monogenesis posits a common descent for all humans. However, it's still asserted that there was distinct racial types due to the unequal distribution of sin after the Great Flood. Polygenism, on the other hand, argued that varieties of humans have different origins. For example, Harvard biologist Louis Agassiz, who was a well-known polygenesis, argued that Black people were created along with other beasts and animals in the Garden of Eden. Throughout this period, attempts were made on both sides to support their theories and racial difference and the inferiority of non-white races more generally with scientific evidence. For example, physician and natural scientist Samuel G. Morton argued that he could define the intellectual ability of a race by examining their skull. In his 1839 book, Crania Americana, Morton claimed that Caucasians had the largest brains while black people had the smallest. However, a closer examination of Morton's work makes it evidently clear that he was conducting biased research as he selectively reported data, manipulated sample compositions, made intentional analytical errors, and mismeasured schools in order to support his prejudicial views on intelligence differences between populations. His followers, Josiah C. Knott and George Glidden, continued his work with their books, Types of Mankind and Indigenous Races of the Earth, which were published in 1854 and 1857. In Types of Mankind, they argued that the races of mankind did not operate from a single pair. Instead, they believed that the creator from the beginning made each race and positioned them in separate homelands to dwell in. They built upon this book, built upon this argument in their book, Indigenous Races of the Earth, where they leaked anthropology and scientific studies of race to establish a supposed natural hierarchy of the races. In this hierarchy, they argued that black people were a creational link between white people and chimpanzees. The polygenesis and monogenesis debate was largely resolved by the 1870s as a result of Charles Darwin's theory of evolution, which was published in his books on the origin of species and the descent of man. Central to his theory was the assertion that all humans shared common origins. However, despite this argument, his notion of natural selection still lent itself to the idea that there were separate um, origins for different types of people. Over time, through his, through his um, philosophy of natural selection, it was thought that advantageous traits became more common in the population and gave rise to a new and distinct species. His evolutionary theory quickly became embedded in larger racial discourses. It was thought that Darwinian forces operated on culture, allowing for a hierarchy of civilization that went from the dark-skinned savage to the civilized white man. For example, this 1899 political cartoon by Victor Gillum depicts two American men carrying alleged savage populations up a mountain. The bottom of the mountain includes labels such as barbarism, ignorance, and vice, while the top is labeled civilization. The people in the basket are obviously caric caricatures of non-white racial groups that were conceptualized as inferior during this time. In addition, the cartoon suggests that the only way for these inferior groups to civilize is through the intervention of white men, as exemplified by the title of the political cartoon, The White Man's Burden. The biological sciences were used to legitimate and reinforce this racial hierarchy through the rhetoric of degeneracy. This was the idea that an individual could change from a more complex to a simpler form and that degenerate racial traits could be passed on generationally. In this context, race was a catch-all term that provided no clear line between the physical or the biological and the cultural or the social. And in showing this history, I show that the justification for racism trans transitioned from theological underpinnings to evolutionary ones. 
ultimately revealing how a number of philosophical and scientific arguments are deployed to justify the unequal treatment of different populations. It's in this context that eugenics, the science of human heredity, emerged in the late 19th century. Eugenics is a set of beliefs and practices that aims at improving the genetic quality of a human population by controlling reproduction. Central to eugenics was the idea of biological determinism, which argues that physical, mental, moral, and behavioral defects, such as poverty, criminality, alcoholism, or bearing children out of wedlock to be unalterable inherited traits. While eugenics professed to be about improving genetic quality, in practice, it really aimed to preserve the position of dominant white groups in society, ultimately with the genocide of those deemed less fit. As such, the targets of eugenics were those seen as unfit for society, such as the poor, the mentally ill, and specific communities of color, including Black Americans, Hispanic people, and indigenous populations. These groups disproportionately fell victim to eugenicist sterilization initiatives beginning in the early 20th century. For example, from the 1930s to the 1970s, nearly one third of the female population in Puerto Rico was sterilized. The US and Puerto Rican governments justified compulsory, compulsory sterilization by connecting the nation's poverty with overpopulation and the hyperfertility of Puerto Ricans. Black women were most notably sterilized in Southern states. For example, from 1929 to 1974, the North Carolina Eugenics Board sterilized nearly 8,000 people who were mostly Black and female. In addition, 60% of Black female residents were sterilized at Sunflower City Hospital without their permission during the 1960s. Finally, an estimated 40% of indigenous women, approximately 60 to 70,000 women, underwent sterilization in the 1970s. In these cases, physicians failed to present potential alternatives and to explain the irreversible nature of sterilization, and they even threatened that the refusal of the procedure would result in women losing their children and or their federal benefits. Racial discourses painted these women as hyperfertile and unintelligent, and ultimately translated in actions that dehumanized and abused them. Eugenic ideologies also drove two syphilis studies that were conducted on black and brown subjects by the United States Public Health Service. The first is the notorious Tuskegee syphilis study, which took place from 1932 to 1972. And the second is the less well-known, but equally atrocious Guatemala syphilis study, which was conducted from 1946 to 1948. I'll quickly rehash the Tuskegee study since I know it's one many people are familiar with, but this is one of the most well-known cases of medical racism and unethical experimentation. For 40 years, researchers tracked the natural history of untreated syphilis in black men in Macon County, Alabama, and withheld treatment from them even when it was found that penicillin could successfully treat the disease. Many often ask, how could this happen and why specifically black subjects? Well, it's important to keep in mind that many of the researchers at the United States Public Health Service received their medical training when eugenic understandings of race were central to their education. In this eugenic framework, syphilis was not just a disease. It also reflected moral and medical inferiority and inordinate sexual appetites in those afflicted. Additionally, Many researchers believe that syphilis disproportionately affected black people, which was not true. As stated by a public health service member named Raymond A. Vondelier, I quote, our present information indicates definite biological differences in the disease syphilis in Negroes and whites. During this period, there was a dominant belief that this Negro disease would spread to white people. And as a result, researchers at the public health service were motivated to fully understand the effects of an untreated syphilis on the human body. Similar eugenic ideologies drove unethical experimentation in Guatemala. And it's also worth noting that the same physician that led the Tuskegee syphilis experiments also led the Guatemalan syphilis experience, um, experiments. His name was John Charles Cutler, 
Um, he was driven to further knowledge on sexually transmitted diseases and to improve pure science. And as a result, rather than just watching the course of syphilis in a human body, they deliberately infected Guatemalan soldiers, prostitutes, prisoners, and the mentally ill with syphilis and other sexually transmitted disease without the informed consent of the subjects. This experiment resulted in at least 83 deaths. Those are the only ones that are recorded. Accounts of the experimental subjects' experiences are horrifying and disturbing. Take, for example, Berta's. I'm only gonna read the bolded parts, but Berta was a female patient in the psychiatric hospital. And in February, 1948, Berta was injected in her left arm with syphilis by Dr. Cutler. Um, as I'll jump to the later part, Berta was not treated for syphilis until three months after her injection. Soon after on August 23rd, Dr. Cutler wrote that Berta appeared as if she was going to die, but he did not specify why. The same day, he put gonorrhoal pus from another male subject into both of Berta's eyes, as well as in her urethra and rectum. He also reinfected her with syphilis. Three days later, on August 27th, Berta died. The Tuskegee and Guatemala experience and the larger history of racism and science and medicine I have highlighted reveal the complex and problematic relationship between race, knowledge production, and power. They reveal how the lives of those deemed inferior can be disregarded and exploited in an effort to maintain notions of racial superiority and to advance scientific and medical knowledge. It would be easy to say that the handful of cases that I've described today are mere deviations when we consider the larger history of the scientific and medical enterprises. It would be even easier to say that these cases have no bearing on the contemporary relationship between race, medicine, and science. The reality, however, is that it is not that easy. As is commonly reported in the United States, Black, Indigenous, and non-white Hispanic people continue to have the worst outcomes on a majority of examined measures of health status, are more likely to be uninsured, face significant disparities in access to and utilization of care, and receive lower standards of care. While this data shows us that people of color continue to face significant disparities in the healthcare system, it fails to reveal its origins. The fact of the matter is that the historical proliferation of ideas about non-white subjects biologically based inferiority has left these groups vulnerable to racist scientific and medical discourses, unethical experimentation, and exploitation that continues to manifest in contemporary racial discrimination and health disparities today. For example, this popular study um, that was conducted in 2016 found that many white medical students incorrectly believe that black people have higher pain tolerance than white people. It's important to note that these are not new findings, but instead date back to the 18th and 19th centuries when racialized interpre interpretations of the nervous system thrived. More specifically, there was a belief that black nerves were thicker and therefore less sensitive, leading to the conclusion that black people felt less pain than whites. The proliferation of this belief did and continues to result in the persistent failure to acknowledge the severity of and denial of equitable pain relief for Black patients. This is particularly relevant when we consider the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, which has revealed how racial bias continues to thrive at the institutional and interpersonal level. As noted by the Centers for Disease Control, long-standing systemic health and social inequities have put people from racial and ethnic minority groups at increased risk of getting sick and dying from COVID-19. Racially based interpretations of pain have also contributed to these disparities. For example, research conducted by Boston-based biotech firm Rubik's Life Sciences found that Black people who visited hospitals with COVID-19 symptoms were six times more likely less likely to get treatment or testing than white patients. This trend is unsurprising when we consider that studies have consistently found that doctors downplay black patients complaints of pain, give them weaker pain medications, and even withhold life-saving life interventions when they need them as a result of ingrained assumptions, cultural ignorance, 
or hostile attitudes towards Black people. Given that Black patients enter the healthcare system with distinct disadvantages, biased medical treatment can be particularly fatal. However, it's also important to note that racial bias is even embedded in medical instruments that are portrayed as producing objective measures. Take, for example, the spirometer, a medical instrument that measures lung capacity and is commonly used across the world for the diagnosis and management of many respiratory diseases. Despite the great variability in lung function measurements over time, geographies, and groups, since the 1960s, much effort has been expended to standardize the many sources of variability. The consequence of this quest for standardization is the common practice of race correction or ethnic adjustment. Spirometers adjust for race by either using a scaling factor for all people not considered white or by applying population specific norms. Race is often determined by either asking patients to self-identify or through the physician's own visual assessment. The notion that there are racial differences in lung capacity can be traced back to the early years of American slavery. In his 1785 book, Notes on the State of Virginia, former President Thomas Jefferson argued that slavery was the best condition to improve the alleged poor lung function of enslaved black people. Drawing explicitly on Jefferson's interpretive framework, plantation physician and slaveholder Samuel Cartwright built his own spirometer in the 19th century to study and quantify differences in lung capacity in enslaved people and white people. He ultimately concluded that deficiencies in black people's lung capacity was 20% when compared to whites. Defining difference as a deficiency continues to be a key organizing principle of lung function measurements in the United States today. As for black people, a normal spirometer reading is typically reduced by approximately 12%. The consequence of this practice are that black people are subject to a different normal and have to demonstrate more lung damage before receiving effective treatment. Racialized conceptions of pain and lung capacity are just two examples of how race becomes institutionalized in medicine and science. Institutionalized racism consists of the collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, culture, or ethnic origin. It can be seen or detected in processes, attitudes, and behavior, which amount to discrimination through unwitting prejudice, ignorance, thoughtlessness, and racist stereotyping, which disadvantage minority ethnic people. The tragic story of Dr. Susan Moore, a Black American female physician who passed away from COVID-19 in December 2020, is now largely considered emblematic of the ways in which racial bias can be embedded in medical practice and procedures. Throughout the course of her hospitalization, Dr. Moore posted videos to her Facebook account describing how her white doctor dismissed her pain and concerns about her treatment. She even shared that her doctor told her that he was uncomfortable giving her narcotics to alleviate her pain and suggested early discharge. Dr. Moore's story is even more devastating when we consider that as a physician, she held a strong command of complicated medical terminology an intricate knowledge of treatment protocols and firmly advocated for herself throughout the course of her care. Yet even this was not enough to save her. It leaves us to only imagine the countless number of patients who needlessly suffer and or die as a result of racially biased medical care. As demonstrated through these case studies, racist practices and behaviors continue to be manifested in medicine and science. Understanding this history and its contemporary manifestations is particularly critical for health practitioners who engage with the diversity of patients and produce the next generation of leaders. First and foremost, it's critical that physicians and other health practitioners recognize and acknowledge the fact that their patients, particularly those from historically underrepresented or marginalized groups, may be entering the medical space with these traumas. For them, Medicine and science may not be conceptualized as therapeutic based on their own or their loved one's personal experiences and knowledge of past and present abuses inflicted by the medical and scientific enterprise. This will require meeting your patient where they are and extending radical compassion towards them. For example, if a patient is hesitant towards a particular procedure or treatment, ask critical questions about their care, 
one should not label them as difficult or non-compliant, but instead try to understand the source of their hesitancy. In doing so, physicians have the opportunity to build genuine and trusting relationships with their patients and provide more effective care. This is particularly relevant when we consider the notion of vaccine hesitancy among Black communities as it pertains to vaccines that are being used to combat, combat the novel coronavirus. The question that often circulates is, what can we do to get the Black community to trust vaccines against COVID-19? However, I find this question incredibly unfair and a bit misleading because it draws our attention to those who have been historically exploited and marginalized by our healthcare system, rather than to the system that has caused the distrust in the first place. It puts the onus on Black communities to simply get over what has happened to the, in the past, and it makes this community's fears appear irrational or insignificant. The better question to ask, I believe, is the following. What can the American healthcare system and the larger scientific and medical community do to ensure that they have the trust of the Black community? In rephrasing this question, we are forced to confront and acknowledge this history. And particularly, in particular, it forces us to explicitly name racism's role in contributing to health inequity and finding ways to effectively confront it. A second and related point is to ensure that delivering culturally competent care does not result in culturally reductionist care. Culture and competency in healthcare describes the ability of systems to provide care to patients with diverse values, beliefs, and behaviors. However, it's critical that we ensure that in our quest to be culturally competent, that we abandon looking at patients as individuals in favor of sweeping generalizations about particular racial or ethnic groups. Take, for example, in a story shared um, by a provider who will remain anonymous. A white female provider in her practice had a disagreement with her black patient about care. The white provider went on to speak to her supervisors and determined that if the black patient is transferred to a black provider, the patient would be less disagreeable about the nature of their care. The black provider and the patient are not informed about this process until the patient is transferred to the new provider. Well, what's the problem here? Transferring the black patient to a black provider without any, for to, any sort of inf um, informing of either subjects undermines the patient's autonomy and the right to ask critical questions about their care. It also assumes that simply being black is enough to provide competent care for a patient, um, which results in very reductionist understandings of race and social, socially political factors and culture. Finally, it's critical to think about the notion of cumulative deprioritization, a term that was put forth by physician scientist, Dr. Tamora Lewis. As she notes, lay people may think medicine is a panacea of limitless resources, but medical providers are constantly triaging and prioritizing which patient gets which tests, drug, family meeting at all times. When doctors and nurses are forced to make multiple quick prioritizations in a day, for sure some implicit bias and deep subconscious beliefs about who matters and who is more valuable or dispensable creep in. Racism in medicine manifests as cumulative deprioritization over many small decisions. No one person is necessarily overtly racist. No one necessarily says we provide less care to black patients, but this is one common way black patients receive different care. Dr. Lewis's words speak for themselves and makes it evidently clear how important it is for individual providers to assess how implicit bias can have reverberating effects that culminate in persistent racial disparities. Racism in science and medicine has a long and fraught history. However, my hope in that is that in making connections between our shared past and present, we can recognize the dangers of relying on race-based investigations and promote a more equitable society. I truly believe that knowledge is power and as health practitioners, we want to think critically about what sorts of ideologies, beliefs, and practices we want empowered in our world. Examining the historical and contemporary legacies of scientific and medical racism is one way we can build institutions and practices that no longer reinforce racial injustice, prejudice, and discrimination in the healthcare system, 
but instead work actively to dismantle them. Thank you. Thank you, Dotary. I am going to get back on the screen in a second. Um, but our audience is welcome to um, ask questions at this time. Um, I have a few questions already, so I will um, I will pose them your way in a moment. For some reason, I am still hiding, but give me a second. Here I am. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I will ask this first question. Um, as we move to continue to have conversations about the COVID-19 vaccine and being able to protect ourselves and our fellow man and woman people, um, how do we start the conversations with those who are skeptical about the vaccine? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I think oftentimes when people express skepticism about the vaccine, the first thing they say is, how was this produced so quickly? And if it was produced so quickly, therefore that means, you know, it doesn't work um, or that it's bad or that it can cause issues. Um, and so we often hear the term, you know, trust the science, which I believe is critical. Um, but I think it's also important to kind of unpack the research process. Um, so, so one way could be to emphasize the fact that, you know, research on coronaviruses have, has been going on for decades. Um, this isn't, research on coronavirus didn't just emerge with the advent of this pathogen um, at the end of 2019. You know, it's been decades worth of research. Um, that is now contributing to the development of these vaccines. But I also think the second thing to emphasize is the fact that the speed in which scientific research is able to happen is directly related to funding. And so with the devastating effects on this pandemic on a global scale, money has been pouring into vaccine development, um, which has allowed for the expedited process of recruiting subjects, of allowing for production, um, of allowing for distribution, even if the distribution is not as effective as it could be. Um, and so I think those, in addition to just saying like, trust the science, I think it's important to kind of, you know, include and describe this research process um, and why this is not only a historic accomplishment for the scientific community, um, but how it was able to be made possible. Thank you. Um, next question um, is, how does your research impact your own interactions with the healthcare system? If you don't mind sharing. Yeah, so um, I'm definitely, you know, people often wonder, ask me like, do you get like depressed, <laughs> you know, reading all this stuff? Um, and I think, I mean, I've been into this for, you know, quite a bit of time, um, but I think increasingly it just makes me a little bit more vigilant. Um, I think people are very quick to try to see things as either good or bad. And I think it's important to hold space for both. Um, and I kind of said this at the beginning, like obviously science and medicine has radically changed the nature of our world, but there's also um, spaces and it's important to kind of be vigilant in particular elements um, because it also has been able to do bad. Um, and so I'm also lucky that I was raised by a mother who's a nurse practitioner and, and have a sister who's a doctor and have another sister who's in healthcare. Uh, who thankfully emphasize in me and all of our siblings and our family the importance of advocating for ourselves within the medical context. Um, and also, you know, having been able to call them like, hey, like this feels weird, like what are your thoughts on this? But I also recognize not everyone has that privilege because um, it is a privilege. And so again, this is why I think it's critical to when we're thinking about in the general society, um, we put so much onus on individuals um, to do the things when they enter a healthcare system, to fight for their rights, to advocate. And those things are important, but we need to be really putting the challenge onto these systems themselves so that vulnerable folks aren't put in a position in which they need to advocate for themselves. The ideal would be to have a system that is equitable and serves all people, not just those that have particular privileges. Thank you. 
Um, I saw some hands raised during the discussion. So if you if you have a question or you would like to make a comment, please feel free to write it in the Q and A, and I will definitely um, take it. In the meantime, I'll um, ask my second question. Um, what sort of racial discourse have you seen throughout the pandemic and why is it important for us, particularly healthcare professionals to dissect this further? Yeah, um, I think the some of the most interesting things I've seen is how race has been deployed from the beginning to the end of, oh, the pandemic's not over, it's still ongoing, but the moment we're in now, um, and so I remember when things were first coming out, I was seeing, you know, questions as to why this um, virus ha is was not disproportionately impacting Black and Brown subjects. There was questions as to why it hadn't yet devastated Africa, the continent of Africa. Um, and then very quickly later, we see that, you know, we're seeing greater manifestation within these communities. And then there's this language of, well, it's an equalizer that impacts all bodies equally. And then very quickly after that, we see that it's disproportionately devastating particular communities. Um, and I think why I find some of this troubling is that at least in the common news articles, that it just says black, Latino, indigenous people die at higher rates. And I think for people that are able to kind of interrogate these things, they know that it is these racial groups that are using our proxies for larger social, cultural, political and economic considerations that don't actually have anything to do with race. Um, but if you're kind of thinking about it within the um, public sphere and, and people that might be outside of those domain, the problem with those type of discourse is that it can naturalize this notion of biological racial difference, that there's something inherently wrong or different with these bodies that's causing them to be disproportionately impacted by this virus. Um, and so I always, I think it's important for us to one, interrogate those types of discourses, but also really sit with what this has revealed about the deep um, social and economic inequality and political um, inequality that is plaguing our nation um, and not be so quick to reduce this to biology. I remember seeing at some point a study that said wider nostrils means that you're less likely to get the virus. Who is, who is typically conceptualized as having wider nostrils? Black and brown people. We all know that is simply not true because we're now seeing which populations are being disproportionately impacted. Um, so I think the quickness in which we run to these biological notions of race to explain the phenomena that's going on in our world can be very deeply troubling um, and continue the trend of ignoring these larger sociopolitical and economic considerations. Thank you. Um, in your talk, you um, discussed call to action and I um, personally appreciated that um, taking steps just beyond the conversation. Um, but a question is, what can people not in the medical field do to help mitigate um, or reduce medical racial, uh, medical racial bias? Yeah, um, that's an that's a important question. Um, I think, well, one, if you have people that are in the medical field, continue to engage with and challenge them. Um, and I think another thing that people can do is to support organizations. I always say that money goes a long way. Um, and there's several organizations on the grassroots level and on the national level that are doing critical work to advocate for and fight for populations that don't necessarily have the means to do that for themselves. Um, and so I do encourage folks to kind of look at organizations within their own sphere um, and see how they're providing critical care for their communities. And then um, another question, and I'm like gauging the time because I definitely want to respect everybody's um, time, but um, what are some practical ways to encourage um, spaces of conversation in our professional environment? Um, and then particularly for leaders in these spaces that um, have that impact and influence? Yeah, so kind of setting up having these sorts of conversations. Um, I think it's about accountability. Um, I don't think there's a single institution who is in the realm of healthcare that has not produced some sort of study or funded some sort of study on racial health disparities. Um, one that just came out recently from my own university was saying that um, the impact of if there had been reparations, then 
Black communities wouldn't have been devastated by the pandemic, which is an interesting take. And I think it's just a regurgitation of research that has already been conducted, um, because we all know that reparations is proxy for economic, political, you know, political, um, you know, affiliation with the larger society. And so I think it's about accountability. Um, it's, a, it's about practicing what we preach um, and not just simply continuing to produce countless studies that are kind of saying the same thing, but, as, but actually calling for action. Um, I think there's many ways in which this can happen. Um, whether, and most of the time it unfortunately has to happen at the grass, grassroots level, um, whether it's you know, medical students advocating for more comprehensive medical education that is not simply focused on um, bio biological elements. I had this happen at Tufts when we had, I had a conversation with some medical students there that they were pushing for that. Um, and so there's strength in numbers. And I think obviously there's so many different elements of this that we could tackle. It also requires, you know, starting with one thing and kind of building up after that. I don't wanna say Lewis hanging fruit, but you have to start somewhere. Um, and I think part of that is, you know, making sure that these universities, institutions, are following up on what they claim to care about um, and coming in strong with the evidence that they might not be. That's great. And then as we reflect on the month and just a history and legacy of incredible past and present leaders, who are some of your scholarly influences um, and why? Yeah. Um, so I have both scholarly influences, people that have influenced my own writing, but also historical figures, Black historical figures in medicine and science that make me really want to elevate their own stories. Um, so I'd say scholarly inspirations would be people like my own advisor, Professor Evelyn Hammonds, who is one of the premier scholars in race and medicine and science. I'm very grateful to work with her. Um, Dorothy Roberts, who I believe is at, still at UPenn, um, who is at the forefront of work in reproductive justice, um, both in law, but also in history of medicine, science and sociology. Um, Keith Waylu is a historian of medicine, a black man at Princeton, who many of his books have been, they inspired me in undergrad to kind of pursue this work because I found it so influential. Um, and in terms of historical figures, there's just so many black people within science and medicine that have been completely ignored. You know, many don't know that the first person to do a successful operation on a human heart was a black man named Daniel Hale in Chicago um, at a hospital that he founded. Um, the first woman to perform open heart surgery was a black woman named Myra Adele Logan in Harlem, New York. Um, the first person to introduce inoculation to this country, which is, you know, the predecessor of vaccines, was in the 17th, was in the 18th century, was a man in Boston named Onesimus Nesby. Um, these are people that, and the first black doctor was in the early 19th century named Rebecca Crumpler. There is just so many people that are, I mean, I don't wanna use the cliche of hidden figures, but there's so many hidden figures within our history. And I'll throw one more out there, Charles R. Drew, who fought to make blood distribution more equitable um, in the 20th and late 19th century, um, worked with the Red Cross and fought for um, the end of segregation within the sphere. And so these are people that I, you know, this is why I do my work. I want to call attention to the abuses, but I also want to call attention to the stories that continue to be ignored and undermined. Um, and that kind of bolster this narrative that black people have just been passive and recipients of abuse and um, of violence, um, but we have resisted. And I also want to give a shout out to the Black Panther Party who did so much work throughout the 1960s and 70s to provide healthcare. Um, to communities when they were literally intentionally and actively desegregated, um, segregated from mainstream hospitals um, and other institutions. Um, we don't tell these stories and that's a problem. Well, Udodori, I just want to thank you um, for joining us today and sharing with us your work. Um, I learned a lot and I know we have conversations all the time and I was still like, oh, I definitely didn't know this. Um, and it sparked me to want to do my own research. Um, and we are definitely working towards a community in our own department where we can have these conversations, um, encourage those to take um, the time to learn, reflect and grow. 
and create opportunities that are safe where people can come as they are. Um, in, do you have a book that you um, would say, you know, that you might recommend to our community um, that you think would be a good read? Yeah, I think um, many people probably know this book, but I'd say a good pairing would be How to Be an Anti-Racist by Ibram X. Kendi. That's been very popular. Yeah, I um, but, but I also think the parallel would be, um, it's, who is it by? It's one on white privilege and I'm blanking on the name. Um, I will send it to you, but I think it's also, as a, in addition to like keeping spaces open, it's also important to hold space for like, making mistakes. And I think that book and being okay, not okay with making mistakes, but not being offended mm -hmm. um, if someone calls you out on a mistake you've made. Um, so I will send you the name of that book because for some reason I am blanking. No problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, we are hitting 6.30. So I definitely want to honor everyone's time. Did you have any thoughts? I, I saw your hand raised for a second. I just remembered the book. It's called White Fragility. Okay, I think we also highlighted that too in our last newsletter. So I'm glad to know we're on the right track. You're on the right track. <laughs> so again, I encourage and I thank everybody for joining us tonight. Um, continue these conversations with your teams. Um, if you have questions or would like to get in contact with Udodori, we will definitely share her information at the conclusion of all of our speaker series. Um, I just wanted to leave everybody with this quote by Nelson Mandela. Um, and he says, if you want the cooperation of humans around you, you must make them feel they are important. And you do that by being genuine and humble. So with that, I hope everyone continues to stay safe and dry um, out here in uh, this amazing weather we have going on. Thank you, Dodri, so much. I appreciate it. And literally, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Thanks. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you, everyone.